My name is Stephen Doetsu Snyder, and I'll be the guest presenter for this evening. I want to thank Rick for inviting me once again to be here and meet with all of you. I always enjoy this time. I'll give you a little background on who I am. Uh, I've been meditating for just under 50 years. I started as a teenager. I began the Zen tradition at that time and have stayed with that tradition for almost 50 years. I've also spent about 20 years, 25 years, practicing in the Theravadan tradition, where I was authorized to teach in uh, 2007 by my teacher, the Venerable Paul Ksaidao of Myanmar, who's uh, considered, certainly was then, and I suspect still is a, both a esteemed scholar, Buddhist scholar, and also a, a master meditator. And so I began teaching the Theravadan Samatha practices, which are the concentration practices. It includes the heart practices, uh, the, the Brahma Viharas, as we call them. And there are a number of other Samatha topics. I believe there's 40 some meditations in the Samatha portion of the Buddhist path, the traditional path. And uh, I'm in the process in the last stages of completing Zen Dharma transmission. So I'll be finished with that probably early next year. And at that point, I'll be a, uh, a fully authorized independent Zen teacher. Um, and you get the title Sensei at that point. So uh, that'll be what happens. My teaching is really a combination of the awakening practices of the Zen tradition, which I think are really uh, unparalleled in their directness and simplicity. And also the heart practices in particular of the Theravadan um, practice path. I think the combination is really uh, a potent, important practice. Uh, one of the unique ways that I teach is that a few years back, I had students who were commenting that they felt they were getting some kind of transmission or empowerment from my teaching. And so I began experimenting with leading guiding meditations, particularly guiding them into the realm of the absolute. And I use the term the absolute to mean the source, the source of all creation and manifestation. And so uh, anyway, tonight we'll do a little bit of one of those, one of the hard practices we'll take on a guided meditation. So I wanted to um, actually start with a little presentation and then we'll go through a meditation, but I wanted to sort of set the table as it were, give information so that you could um, make, uh, have more contact, more traction with the meditation. And I will mention I've had five books published now, including Buddha's Heart, which is a different uh, new presentation of the Brahma Viharas. I've written a book called Demystifying Awakening about the awakening process in both the Theravadan and the Zen tradition, how they compare and contrast uh, in a variety of other material. And then I have a newest, my newest book is called Trust and Awakening. It's a retranslation of the first Zen poem called the Zing Zing Ming. And uh, it's a book, really tremendous poem. And I changed around some of it a little bit to feel like I dialed in the focus a little more and then provided commentary on that. And I've got a new book I'm turning in in October that I'm calling now Always Becoming Buddha. And it's a book about the Buddha's practice and really addressing the question whether Buddhahood is possible for people in this day and age. So let me go ahead and get started. Uh, we will have time for questions after the meditation. So uh, feel free to hold on to your questions till then. Uh, so I'm going to be focusing tonight on the quality of unconditioned love. And in Buddhism, it's understood that there is, in effect, a conditioned world and an unconditioned world, let's say. And the conditioned world is our normal world, 
And condition means that something is subject to birth, decay, and death. So it has a conditioned existence. And there's also phenomenon that are unconditioned. The unconditioned don't have a birth, they don't have a decay or death. So whatever's unconditioned is always in existence and always will be, always has been. So the quality of the absolute, the, the territory, the realm, the presentation of the absolute is an unconditioned presentation. So when we make contact with the absolute, we are touching into something that is timeless and always present. The beneficial news of it always being present is that we don't have to uh, earn it. We don't have to behave a certain way to get access. We can't ever sever our contact or connection with the absolute. So there's nothing that you can do or have done that will eliminate you from contact with the absolute. So just to say that up front. So when I say unconditioned love, I'm meaning love that is a function, a quality of the absolute. Within my presentation of the absolute, there's two areas of primary function. And the first is what I call the unmanifest. So it hasn't come into any kind of form yet. And this would be chiefly characterized by a quality that I call absence, what would traditionally be called emptiness in Buddhism. There's no abiding self. There's no conditioned quality to it. So it's an unconditioned nothingness, yet it has a kind of something to it. There's a quality, a felt sense to it. The chief qualities in the unmanifest would be peacefulness and stillness. If we were to be drawn deeply into the peacefulness and stillness, we could come in contact with the experience called cessation. Cessation is an experience that's paramount in the Theravada tradition for one to advance along the stages of awakening from stream enterer to arahant. Um, there must be a significant experience of cessation. And cessation means that all phenomenon, all materiality and mentality cease, they stop. So, the, so we begin to have the experience of cessation and then it's a lights out experience. We only know that cessation has happened after we awaken, after we, uh, after our mentality and materiality come back online. We know something's different if it's been a significant enough experience. The manifest is the other functioning of the absolute, and that primary quality is presence. So beingness, hereness, nowness, that kind of a felt sense. Also, there's unconditioned love, so love without condition. And then there's pure awareness, which is awareness without concept. So it's only direct awareness. We know what something is by the direct contact, not by the mentalizing about it. So those are the, the primary functions of the absolute. So we're going to be focusing on unconditioned love tonight. So everything in our awareness, everything in our consciousness, all materiality stems from and is enlivened by universal love. To come into creation, it's a combination of both the presence and the unconditioned love powered by the absence, by the emptiness by the peace and stillness. And that's what causes the flower to, uh, the stem to arise from the dirt and the flower to open. That's the enlivening part that these, these provide. So once again, the universal love has no beginning or end. So it's not something that we have to create, that we have to do anything with. We're not responsible for manufacturing it we simply need to open to it. It's already here. So it's found in each of our consciousnesses. In the Zen tradition, we talk about qualities of the absolute in our consciousness as being our true nature, who we truly are. The love is really the viscosity. It's really the propellant of all reality, of all states of consciousness, of all realms, of all universes. 
The love is the primary force there. When we are able to make contact, which is mostly about us relaxing and accepting, it's less about doing and more about letting go of doing. So when we are making contact with that unconditioned love, we can feel held by the universe. We can feel an attunement that has a remarkable clarity. And we can feel that we're being taken care of in a loving and appropriate manner or way. So it really can feel we're connected, we're, we're in contact with something significant and that allows us to relax more we don't need to assert as much of our personality patterning we can rest more in what's unconditioned the universal love unconditioned love is typically experienced as gentle soft intricate sweet and beautifully delicate and yet it also has a kind of robustness uh, because it's unconditioned, nothing can cause it to decay or die. So it's always in full abundance. Universal love also affords us a sense that we can trust in the rightness of the universe. We can trust that everything will be more than okay. So if we're wondering if we're struggling in life and we can make contact with this unconditioned love, it will let us relax, invite some ease, put down our worry or anxiety and rest in a knowing that there is a beneficial universe functioning and things are going to work out. We may not know how, but they are going to work out. So what are some of the resistances to unconditioned love? Well, the first is hatred. So hatred shows up in us in two forms. One is a white hot destruction and the other is cool and cold like an assassin. Anger is also will be a psychological or emotional block to unconditioned love. And this is really where we're upset, we're feeling weak, we're perhaps fearful, and we respond with anger to show that we have strength, that we can make a difference, we are here, we object to what happened, but that's going to be blocking us from the unconditioned love. And then aversion, this is a, a common hindrance in Buddhism, aversion is really the rejecting the idea that if we can keep away the unpleasant or bad, we will enjoy only the good or the pleasant. But if we're if we're splitting hairs, deciding what to be aversive about and what to draw near, we're trying to divide the unconditioned. So we're bringing a conditioned quality in, which causes us to lose contact with the unconditioned love. Some of the most common blocks people have would be self judgment. And any kind of I say self hatred, but I mean it in a way, a softer way that when there's a kind of self rejection, when we're, we're not wanting to behave in this way or be this particular person, we're rejecting what is here, the truth of what's here. And so that's the way that's keeping us away from the undividedness of unconditioned love. Also guilt and shame. They can become a filter blocking us from making contact. Typically when guilt and shame arise, there's some form of self-judgment. The psychology folks will talk about this as the inner critic or superego. This is that judging parental-like figure that we've internalized and structured to keep us walking the right path and not stepping off into problems. So lastly, what can appear similar to unconditioned love and yet not be 
unconditioned love. Well, we can have an unhealthy attachment. So we have an unresolved neediness, a kind of emotional or psychological stickiness. We want to attach to the other, but it's more we're grabbing onto them rather than letting them come and meet us and having a contact that's of equals. This is a grabby kind of attachment. Desire can appear similar to unconditioned love. So this is wanting that certain someone or something that we believe will fix us permanently. If I can just be with this person, if I can just have this job, have this experience, then everything's going to be fine. So I'm already coming from a place of insecurity, and then I'm looking for something in the conditioned world that will fill that need. So I'm not in contact with what's unconditioned. And then finally, possessive love. So this is love where we are making demands upon a significant other that they attend to our needs before their own. So these are all ways that we can block or, or turn away from unconditioned love. I raise these just so if they do arise, you'll recognize them as they are, and we can turn back to the unconditioned love. So let's go ahead and settle in for meditation. Start by taking about five or six deep belly breaths, really filling your belly as full as you can, and then slowly releasing the air Letting your awareness settle deeply into this moment. Feeling yourself in your seat, your contact with the floor. Sense the security and, and the stability of the building you're in, providing you with safety and holding. And if you can sense our Mother Earth beneath, holding each of us in this moment, offering us nourishment, even this very breath. And this is all offered by Mother Earth without asking for anything in, our, in return. It's freely given without restraint, without condition. The earth doesn't prefer any country, any people, any religion. All are loved and accepted equally. All right, now start by bringing your awareness to your belly. We're wanting to make contact with what we call the hara in the Zen tradition. It's about two finger widths below your navel and about two finger widths in from the surface of the skin. If you can, breathe in directly to the hara. Noticing if you can sense the, the quality of groundedness, the deep pureness that's present. Let yourself relax and settle into the hara. It's a natural grounding in our body. And when we're there, it lets us relax and let go. We don't need to be in charge of anything. It's all being taken care of.
Now on your next in-breath, invite awareness into the heart area. And I really mean the chest cavity. I'm not talking about our human heart, the physical heart, but something more. Sense into the heart area, just feeling what's here. Noticing if there's a quality In my teaching, I call innate goodness. We recognize innate goodness. It has a buoyancy, an effervescent lightness, a warm flow, a radiance, letting us know everything is just fine. Or perhaps you're feeling some other quality in your heart. Just be close to what's here. Relaxing. Surrendering. To this heart quality that you're in touch with. Feel your body relax, your mind and thoughts relax. Notice the sense of trust. We can trust that everything's going to be okay. Feel the warm, rejuvenative, rejuvenative quality of innate goodness and unconditioned love. With your next in-breath, bring awareness to the center of your forehead. In the Theravadan tradition, this is called the wisdom eye. In the Zen tradition, it's called the Dharma eye. This is how we have inner sight. If you're a visual meditator, this is how you're seeing what's unfolding in your practice and your meditation. It also helps us develop intuitive knowing, which is important on a spiritual path. See if you can breathe in to the wisdom eye, just being open and slightly curious. You don't need to figure it out, just be with it. Breathing in. Perhaps feeling that quality of knowingness. Kind of settled understanding. On the next in-breath, invite awareness to the top of your head. It's called the crown chakra in the chakra system. You may feel a kind of pressure, perhaps an energy swirling, or, or maybe nothing at all. Each of these is just fine.
I have you make contact here because this is the portal for journeying to other realms and other universes. Notice if you feel a kind of energy movement around the crown chakra. For those of you with inner sight, you may be noticing a bright white coming into our field of awareness. The brightest white you've ever seen. Brilliantly white. Like the sun reflected in a mirrored building. Almost too much to look at, but not quite. Notice how it feels to have this bright, white, fluffy, cloud-like substance in our field. Feels pristine and pure. Feels deeply accepting. And you may be contacting the love quality the beautiful, pure, all welcoming love. Every part of you is welcome here. Even the parts you don't particularly like. Let yourself relax into this love, the bright white light of the fluffy love cloud. See if you can let go and just be here. Letting go putting down, resting deeply in this magnificent, unconditioned love, we'll sit silently here for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then I'll ring the bell. <laughs> 